Okay, I'm going to give you my first scripture already so you can go there. And it's a scripture that you probably have memorized. It's John 3, uh, 16, 33. And I'm going to do part. Who was here for Cave Knot like two weeks ago? Wow, only seven and my phone is not turned off. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow, what a shame. Okay, can we go back to the title first? They can go. We're not going to park there. But remember, what was the tagline from the last one? Cave not, where was the tagline? For the seven that came. What are you doing? Okay, so today we're going back and we're going to, but the tagline has changed to, <clears throat> this is not the tagline. Is where are you? Okay, praise Jesus. I, uh, we can do this. So, so write it in your notes. Okay, so part two is Cave Not, but you know how I always have to be a subtitle. My subtitle for tonight is Where Are You? And I was trying to uh, come up with, uh, you know, cooler taglines for you uh, and for us, for us growing up. could be, what's your 20, right? We understand that means where are you, right? And then I thought, because I have to address you guys, I thought, I don't know what's cool to say, like, where you be, where you at? <laughs> you know, that's your tagline. So you choose it or you can come up with your own. But... But I'm here to tell you that, first of all, before I start, I want to say that the God said, open up with this statement. So that's for all of us. So let me tell you that your life matters to God more than you think. Amen. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you think that your life doesn't matter. Your choices doesn't matter. Maybe no one cares about me. But let me tell you that there is someone who cares about you. If you belong to this church, there's someone who cares about you, and that's the body of Christ. We have a soaring God, a holy God, a powerful God who believes in you, who's, who believes in his redemptive power. Do you know that you and I, he has a plan, and his plan is for redemption? His plan is to rescue us. His plan is that we walk on this earth as it is in heaven. His plan is that we take him at his word no matter what we face. And let me tell you that no one is, is exempted from going to trials. No one is exempted to be in a cave. And what's a cave? Uh, I haven't been in caves a lot because I haven't seen one. No, just kidding. I've been to a cave in, uh, in Shasta, up in, up in uh, it's by Northern California. And I was like, I mean, they, they show you, it's been there for millions of years, right? You're like, what is this? Since the foundation of the world, this was here a million years ago. But I was like, should I go in? Should I not go in? And um, I went in my own flashlight. I didn't have one. So they said, no, it, you can see it. And so I went in. And this is because they have put lights inside, but it's dark. That to the point that if you are claustrophobic, you're going to go into a panic attack. I was like, I have Jesus, I have Jesus. But I was like, ah, 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 right? But it's dark. And the deeper you go in the cave, the darkest it gets. And so we are, many, 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 many of us are going to experience those times. And I'm going to tell you that God is not afraid of your cave moment. Amen. He's not. We are afraid. Other people might be afraid, but he's not in heaven thinking like, oh, my goodness. What is Virginia doing in that cave? What is so-and-so doing in that cave? He already has his redemptive plan, and his plan never fails. Amen. And uh, today, right, we, we spoke about 9-11. Uh, Who remembers 9-11? I remember that I was so shocked. I couldn't... I couldn't even fathom while I was watching that TV what was happening. And I come from El Salvador and I have seen a lot of things. But I couldn't even fathom what was happening here. And we've been praying for, for the families, for those who lost their lives. But, you know, around the world there's so many things. And since then I believe that the history of the United States was changed. But you know what hasn't changed? is that redemptive power of God. That hasn't changed. He never changes. And, um, and I'm going to talk to you about tonight, and it's not a message. Maybe it's not a popular message. It's, a, it's not a self-help message. It's not a uh, make me feel good message. I'm just going to talk to you the reality that you have in God through Jesus Christ. 
because we have a, you have your own reality and then there's God reality, there's God's truth. And I don't know if you've heard about this pastor that just, um, uh, I want to say he, he uh, died by suicide. And I'm going to tell you how easy it is to go on, on, on social media and to just give your two cents. But I'm here to tell you that you and I, as the body of Christ, we cannot, and this is me, and you know my story, you know what I'm going through, but I'm here to tell you that I refuse to reduce God because of my experiences. And that's a choice. I refuse to get on that wagon that everybody's going and saying, like, oh, my gosh, if you have depression and anxiety, let me tell you that our youth suffers and deals with a lot of depression. And if we don't know it, and if we're trying to, you know, like, I don't see that in Jesus' name, I'm going to tell you that we're not being the church. But we cannot allow, I'm not denying my experiences or the lack of thereof, but I'm not going to put God, I'm not going to box them in this limited space because of my past or because of my experiences or because of my pain or because of the betrayals that life will get to you, give you, the punches of life, the storms of life. You and I have a choice to reduce, not to reduce God to our circumstances. I cannot proclaim that, oh, my God, he, my God is not that powerful. My God is absent in times of my cave time. No, he's not absent. I might feel like he's absent, but he is more present if you allow his presence to be felt in your life. I believe that as a church we exist. We are the hope of the world. Jesus die for us so that we can live a life not just it's not just a ticket to heaven and I think we focus a lot on that right and we we think like you know what as long as I'm saved going to heaven I'm gonna allow life and I'm gonna live on this earth like hell well hell not And please do not send me uh, your, your letters or opinions or go on like what I'm about to tell you because I'm going back to the word. I'm not going to say anything that is based on my feelings, my experiences, my past life, or whatever. I'm not going to speak about that. I'm going to speak who God is in the midst of right now and who you and I can be in this time. Amen. Because the church has to wake up. The church has to wake up. The church has to have compassion. And I pray, like, if you have never been depressed, thank God. You know what? Give glory to God and rejoice. But do not judge. If you don't understand what it is to be on a cave, if you don't understand what it is to have anxiety, if you don't understand what it is to have panic attack, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand what it is to have PTSD, if you don't understand to, what it is to have trauma, then you know what? If you don't understand it, just pray that God will give you the wisdom and that we can be there for one another. I'm praying, I'm praying that this church will awaken. This church will awaken and that we will not be afraid to talk about those things that scare people. The world already has a stigmatism. The world already, like, I, I, ha I haven't even been on social media and I read just one post and it was like, shut the hell up. Because it's hell. They're not speaking the good news. So if it's not the good news, who are you proclaiming? It is what it is, right? No, we need to, like, your words matter. If you're going to post, you know what? Go find out where those people live and go tell them in their face. Amen. And then see if you're standing for the good news or your opinion. Do not stand for your opinion. I can't believe that someone said, that pastor is going to hell. Go back to the word. 
And I'm not going to stay there, but I think even youth need to know that this should be a safe place. The church should be the safest place where people can come and be brokenhearted. Can people can come and have whatever they're dealing with. You know, we, we don't even talk about mental health illness because that's a curse word in the church. It is real. It is real. But there is a real God that can heal it. I'm not speaking like, whoa, a victim. No, I'm not saying that. And no one knows who are we to say, like, why these people make their choice. You don't know their past. You don't know their decisions. You don't know what they have gone through. So be quiet. And pray for the family. Pray for the family. Let's go back to the word of God. Okay, are we good? Do I need to do a dance? Rap some song? Do bad I don't remember any songs right now. But since the beginning, God created you and I in the image and likeness of God. Did you know that? You know, when people tell me now, like, you know who my daughter is, right? She's so beautiful. Where's my daughter? Oh, over there. Mm. You know my son? He's so handsome. He looks like his mama. I just got to say... He has my wittiness. No, but as if you're a parent, right, when someone tells you, like someone told me lately, people are telling me, like, oh, your daughter looks just like you, and I grow taller. You know? Because I, I, I don't see that, but, hey, she's beautiful. I'm, I'm taking it. You know, there's a, there's a pride. There's this, as parents, we're like, oh, really? Oh, Isaac looks like you. He, when he was little, he would be, no, mom, I don't want to look like a girl. I was like, no, baby, you look like your daddy. It's okay. You would just have the same features, but no, you're not a girl, right? Uh, because it's like, no, I want to look at my daddy. But, but, but it's so good, right? As a parent, do you, get, do you feel great when someone tells you your kid looks like your spouse? Yes. Well, you don't want to look like a lechero, no, right? The person who delivers, <laughs> the Amazon guy, right? The deliver UPS guy. You want them to look like in your likeness and your image, right? Okay, so that's the way God feels about you. He feels great when someone says, you know what? When I talk to you, you're the essence of Jesus Christ. Oh, God is like, oh, that's my girl. That's Sarah Castillo. Oh, she hugs so good. You know, when we choose to speak life when someone is down, God is like, ah, that's my son, that's my daughter, standing for the truth of God, not the opinion of men. And I pray that those who are easily opinionated, I pray that they never get to that space. That they never feel that alone, that they never go through a depression, they never go through that anxiety, they never go through that. Because once you're in that arena, it's a different, it's a different sport. And to me, at this point in my life, I, I really, opinions do not matter to me. You know that there is freedom when opinions do not matter to you? But opinions were people that have been, that have shown up and been able to show up in the arena where I have been and they show up, oh, I respect that opinion. We need to give honor to whom honor is due. And as a church here, we're not going to be afraid to talk of things that people don't talk about it. People have so much empathy and compassion for someone who suffers cancer. You will never go to someone who suffers cancer and say, do not go and take, do radiation. Do not go through uh, chemotherapy. Do not take the medicine because if you're taking the medicine, then you're not you're not staying in faith. We don't do that. But see, we don't understand mental health issues, so we're going to say, you know, your faith is not enough. You are not faithful enough. You're, you didn't have faith in us. You, you didn't have hope enough. And I'm going to tell you, when you're in those moments, you will lose hope. You feel like you're losing hope, but then again, we have a hope, and that name is a substance. It's something that is tangible. It's something that is real. It's something that dwells inside of us. So my hope, whether I feel like it's gone, that's, that's why you need people that are going to lead you back to Jesus. 
Do you know how safe it is to go to somebody and say, you know, I'm not doing too well today, and they just let me cry? And at the end of the day, they're not going to change. They're not going to see me less than because I'm crying and not having a good day. See, that's the church. You, you read the Old Testament, the New Testament. The Old Testament actually pa paints a picture of redemption and love. God created this world so we can live in a beautiful garden. And when he did that, there was nothing. There was everything. There was no shame. There was no disappointment. There was no depression. There was no anxiety. There was no marital issues. There were not family issues. There was nothing. Nothing was lacking. Nothing was missing. But once men decided to rebel against God, then that's the day that our history changed. So, but this is a good message. I know I'm a little bit intense, but I'm going to assure you that I'm not upset. So you can laugh, right? Because I feel like I can feel, I can feel. There's no song about that. Okay, John 16, 33 says, these things I have spoken to you. Okay, this is the word of God. This is Jesus speaking. This is that in me you may have peace. Can we have peace in the midst of our trials and tribulations? We can't. Oh, but I don't feel it. Oh, but you can have it. But see, that's a, that's a mindset. That's a perspective. And if you are honest enough, I'm going to ask you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever been in a dark place and you thought that God left you, you tell me, did you feel peace in that moment? No. No. No, you didn't. But if you put the word of God inside of you, is the word, it's because the word is not an it, it's a he. The word became flesh, and that flesh is Jesus Christ. But if you have the word, that's what we need, the word. You can't live by the opinion of men. You have to live by the word of God. And the righteous and the men of God and the woman of God should live by the word of God. You don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of a pastor. Does that it says that? <laughs> you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of someone who can speak to thousand people. You can you cannot live by bread alone, but you can live by someone who's well spoken. He has gathers arenas of people. No, we live by the word of God. Amen. But you cannot live by the word of God unless you know the word of God and you need to know the word of God because if you know Jesus, you have to discover who he is. It's not just knowing. We have not been called to be fo uh, just fans of Jesus, right? Because fan died out. Like, you know, I'm a hardcore and people hate because I am a Patriots girl. Woo! Shout for that person. <laughs> And I am very, very, I was going to say, it is a pride to be a Patriots girl. And people ask me, but why? You're not, you know, I'm not even from here, so I can choose any, any team that I want. But I don't care. I choose whoever I choose to follow. And I always tell people, you know, I'm not a fan, I'm a follower. Because when Brady goes, I'm still going to be a Patriots fan. But other people just follow teams because of their players. And when those players are moved, then, okay, I'm not a 49er now. I'm a Rams now because they move so-and-so. And, -so. and many of <laughs> And many of us, we do that. Okay, we're going through a, se a season in our lives that is being hard. It's being like it, you're in a season of life that is hard, that you don't have the peace of God. And then guess what? We move teams. You're like, no, I don't. And I'm not talking about moving churches. I'm talking about who are you listening to? Who's speaking into your life? Who's speaking while you're in the dark place? Who is speaking? Who are you listening to? Who is your daddy? Right? And that's based on John. You have to, first John, second John, go read it, right? That's why I'm encouraging to read your Bible. Are we okay still? You know, we're living in a, in a world right now that is it's so easy. It's so easy to get disappointed. Have you been disappointed with people lately? Only me? Right? It's so easy to be annoyed by people. Right? You want to punch them? 
Just me? You guys are so holy. Pray for me. But it's so easy to succumb to this pair when things are not working out the way I thought. God gave me this plan. He called me to be a pastor. He called me to do this. But wait a minute. I, I am full in despair, but I cannot share with people because they will judge me. I'm going to jump to another scripture, and I think it's John, my other John scripture. See if you guys. Oh, I love this scripture. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do you know the world condemn means? It means he didn't send his son to shame the world. I, to me, to this day, shame has never changed me. Does it make you change when someone just shames you because of your mistakes or because of your whatever, and they shame you? How dare you? Shame will never transform anyone. It didn't say, I sent my son to guilt the people into becoming and, and coming to God. No, he says, I sent my son. Since the beginning, I sent my son not to condemn them or not to shame them, not to make them feel guilty, but I'm here as a savior. And until Jesus Christ returned, he is acting as a savior. He says, no, I sent my son to save the world, to rescue the world, to make the, the world healed. And then after that, guess what? He went to heaven and he left a lot of agents on this earth. And you know who's that agent? Who? It's you. It's you. You are the church. You are the church. It's not the building. It's not the denominations. You are the church. We are the change agents. We are to represent the kingdom of heaven on this earth. We are to represent that love that he gave us so freely. So in other words, we were guilty. Guilty. You know what? I don't deserve any forgiveness, and it's okay because Jesus said, you know what? It's not because of what you've done or what you didn't do. It's because, I mean, actually, God says, you are forgiven. You have been acquitted because of what my son did for you. And because of what he did for you, I'm going to count you as righteous. I'm going to count you as, as in right standing with God. So that should be good news. And just because we are children of God, it doesn't mean that we're exempt from many trials and tribulations. We need to have confidence while we're going to a trial. We need to have confidence when we are going to a dark moment. Sometimes we lose confidence because we are praying to God, but I already in my mind have a way. I already, I already plan my own way of escape or the way that God is going to rescue me. Right? Let's say... Um, I will be in the sea, you know, I don't, in a lake. Let's put a lake because it's more safe, right? Why? Because I don't know how to swim, right? But let's say I'm in the lake and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drowning, right? And I'm praying to God, Lord, rescue me, send an angel. And then Isaac is calling me, Mom, I'm going to be happy. No, I want an angel. And then my husband sees it and he's like, let's go on a jet ski and get Virginia. No, no, not you. I want God to rescue me. And then Alexis brings all this crew and she's swimming because she's a good swimmer, right? Mom, give me your hand. No, I refuse to because I want to see God. I already saw him. He's going to deliver me. This is the way he's going to deliver me. An angel is coming down. He's going to give me the hand and I'm going to be rescued. And I'm going to even want to walk on water. And I'm going to come a uh, sensation on YouTube. <laughs> so I refuse to be rescued. Because in my mind, and I'm going, of course, I'm, I'm being dramatic, right? But then at the end, you drown. And you end up in heaven. And you're like, I don't know what happened, Lord. I thought you were faithful. He's going to be, Virginia, I sent, I sent your son with the floaties for you. I sent your daughter with the crew. Your husband passed by with the jet ski. 
and you refused because you thought that this is the only way I can work and rescue you. What idea do you have that that's the only way that God is going to rescue me? What idea have you fabricated? I know that God is, will answer me until I see these things. Remember we talked about the last time I'm not going to go into like the prophet Elijah. He asked for signs and he got all the signs. He got an earthquake and that even, even shook him. He got three things. It was like until God spoke. And he was a very... Small, still voice, like, what are you doing here? Are we getting this? Okay. We have been given the greater, greater gift that is, you know, that power to choose. A free will. It's easy to blame God for all of our problems because, you know what? And he takes a bad reputation because his children, we are good at blaming God. I, I, I'm honest, I have, I have many times said, you know, God, this is you. If you could have just come and been on time, if you would have been here, if you wouldn't have let that person that I want to punch hurt me. I'm just dizzy. I did say that, though. I wouldn't be where, I, where I'm at. If you would have just stopped it. You know, those could have, would have, you know, that God is not interested in that. He's interested, okay, then here you are. Let's see, let me help you get out of it. He already know how you got there anyways. But he wants you to know that he's available no matter if you yourself did your own custom building of your cave. Or maybe your problem didn't come because it was something that, no, maybe it was because you made some bad decisions. But let me tell you that God is not moved by bad decisions. Does that mean like we live and choose whatever we want? No, but what I'm trying to tell you is that he's always, his plan is to be redemptive. I can redeem you. Whatever the enemy has lost and whatever you lost because of your choices, I still redeem you and I want to redeem your time and I want to redeem your life. You know, I just had a birthday. Yeah. I'm celebrating all month. So if you didn't get to bless me, you can bless me. If you want to know my age, I will tell you, but you have to give me a dollar for each year. If you really want to double bless me, you multiply the dollar in the year for two, and then you know. Just saying, right? Like, you know, why not? And don't write me a letter. And I mean it. Don't write me a letter. Don't post on Facebook about me. Because I'm not going to read it. Okay, we have been given the greatest choice, as I said, the power to choose. I have six minutes. And I have, you have been given the choice to advance. You have been given the choice to grow. You have been given the choice, the choice to, to overcome. Because he says that he had, he came, Jesus said he came to give us peace, peace and to give us peace more abundantly, he to give us life. And he says, I did. He says, be of good courage because I have overcome the world for you. That means that we can overcome fear. And fear is not overcome one time, one day. Like, oh, God, over, God did deliver me from fear. I'm not going to have fear forever. That, no, 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 that's what it is. We, are, we go from glory to glory to glory. Romans 12, 2, it says that we are to renew our mind according to the word. Of God, so we can decide, we can decipher, not decipher, but we can separate the truth from what is not truth from the word of God. Yeah. Right? But if we don't know the word of God, then we're confused, and anyone can confuse you. Yeah. Go back to the word of God. So you get to overcome one day at a time. You go to you get to overcome again and again and again and again. And I know that many of you are sitting here and you're very tired. You're saying, you know, I just want someone to rescue me. I just want someone to stand for me. I just want someone to believe that I'm able to get out of this place. I'm going to tell you that you have someone who agrees with you in that matter. And you know who he is? Jesus. You're looking for a person. You're looking for people. And actually, he is the one. Jesus is the answer. And you could go to Genesis. I'm closing super soon. Let's go to Genesis quickly, quickly. I don't hear it. 
Are you there yet? Okay. Remember how I told you that the God didn't just one day, he's like, you know, I'm going to send Jesus and I'm going to give them a redemptive plan, you know, that he started the moment that Adam and Eve fell, that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. He started, his plan was, was started in motion that day. And let's pick it up in Genesis 3-7. I encourage you to read Genesis, uh, Genesis 3-7, and I'm going to jump from 7 to 9 and 10. And it says, this is, this is after, after Adam and Eve has, thank you, Adam and Eve um, ate the fruit, disobeyed God, right? So I'm picking it up from there because after that, then they were like, they realized, what have we done? And you know when the enemy, when the serpent came to them, he says, if you eat out of this fruit, guess what? God just doesn't want you to know from good and evil. But he says, but you will be like God. Isn't that ironic? Because they were already made like God. But the enemy will twist the word of God and makes you think that, oh, wait a minute. God didn't say that. Am I right with God? Am I not right with God? So verse 7 says that then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and that they and they fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Under like coverings. They realize that they have sinned. Verse 9 and 10 says, And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. There you have it. Before them, before they were in communion with God, before they were just in the garden with God, they would walk with God, there was no shame. There was no betrayal. There was no family bickering. Adam wasn't blaming Eve, and Eve wasn't blaming Adam. Right? We read it, they were blaming each other. It's the woman that you gave me. It's the man that you gave me. But that's when shame, fear, covering up and hiding went in motion. You know that? And we have been doing that ever since. Since We have been doing that ever since. We have experienced shame, fear, we cover up things, and we hide. There's no one that has been born on this earth since then that has not experienced those kind of emotions. The only one, and that's what Jesus, that's what God sent Jesus, because he was the only one who overcame shame, fear, covering up, and hiding. And that's why he said, I came to overcome for you so you don't have to live in shame. What is it so shameful? There, there's many people sitting here tonight that you are so shameful because of some decisions that you made. I'm going to tell you that if you trust God and if you believe in the work and his redemptive plan through Jesus Christ, you don't have to walk one more day in shame. You might feel it tomorrow, but I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking today because faith is today. Maybe you're sitting here and you're, and, you're, and you're gripped, you're paralyzed with fear. Well, let me tell you that you can overcome fear today. And when it comes back, you overcome it again and again. Amen. Or maybe you're sitting here and you're very depressed, you're, you're very anxious, and maybe you even have suicidal thoughts. I'm going to tell you that you can overcome that today. Today. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow hasn't come, but today you can overcome. Because the hope of the world dwells inside of you and me. I am alive today, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm honestly, I'm alive today, and I'm very open about it. I am alive today because there is a God with a redemptive plan, and he sent his son to die for me. And because he sent his son to die for me, I can walk in the wholeness and healing. Do I feel great? No. There's days that I wake up depressed. There's days I don't want to take a shower. But that day I wake up and just taking a shower is a hallelujah for me. You might see it as a weakness. You might see it and say, well, she doesn't have faith enough because if she would have faith, she wouldn't be where she's at. Well, you don't know my past. You don't know my problems. You don't know my struggle. So if you don't know people's details, you know, pray for them. But one thing I want to tell you, and whatever you have to do, because everyone, own your own story. And whatever you have to do, you do it for you. You have to take medication, do it for you. I'm one of them. And you know what? I'm not going to shut up about it. 
I'm not, I'm not going to say you do it, but that's my story. I have to see a therapist. You know, I have to do it. That's me. That's me. And if you have a problem with it, unless you've been where I've been, then you keep on praying. But I don't want to be the church that covers everything. And you know what? In the church, you are going to get hurt. I think the places where I've been hurt, I've been hurt in the church. But I cannot reduce my God and what he did and his redemptive power and who Jesus is because his children did something for me, to me. I can't do that. I refuse to do that, and that's a choice. I'm not going to abandon the church because someone hurt me, someone betrayed me. I'm not. I am not. I don't abandon it because it's a choice. And that, that's being brave. You want to talk about faith? That's faith. If you're still here and you came tonight, that's faith. And you know what? We applaud you. You cry all you want. I'm going to tell you the second Adam had to come, and that's Jesus Christ, to make things right. Jesus came to execute the plan of redemption. He came to pay our, for our sins. He came to pay for the price of our rebellion. He came to make it possible for you and I to overcome. And yes, we overcome. Yes, this shall pass. Yes, this is temporary. Yes, you've been in hell, but let me tell you, getting out, out of hell. And you know, I'm going to tell you that you need you need the body of Christ. And I'm not saying you go, and just because I have a pulpit, I'm sharing this with you, and I hope that you're taking it the right way. I'm not saying to you, go get medication. I'm not saying to you, you do what you need to do for you. But I'm here to tell you that one thing that we do need is we need the word of God. We need the body of Christ. There's people here that without them, the Bible says that it was my scripture, Galatians 6 something. If you put my scripture and I'm closing with this, carry one another's burden in this way, you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is the law of Christian love. Where is the Christian love? Where is it? Well, no one has loved me. You be it. And carrying each other's burdens doesn't mean, hey, I'm going to take away your pain. No, it means, you know what? When you lose your hope, I can hope for you. Amen. I'm going to carry your hopeless. It's okay because I'm going to hope for you. Do you know I have like three people here, four people? That, and I am so thankful that they have never judged me. But when I was hopeless, they say, you know what? I'm going to hope for you. No, but I can't see it right now. I can't see the light. You know what? I'm going to see the light for you. I'm gonna, I already going to see Jesus, but I don't see Jesus right now. It doesn't matter because I'm going to see him for you because I am doing my part as the church, as the body of Christ, and I'm going to carry your hope because you're hopeless. When was the last time that you carried someone that lost their hope? When was the last time? Or did you shove them with the scripture? Believe me, I believe that without community, I wouldn't be alive. Yes, you can go take medication. That's a tool. See it as a tool. I see things as tools. Yes, I go to therapy. I see it as a tool. But I also have meditation with Jesus. You know what? Through people here in this church, you know what I call those moments? I call them Satla moments. And I'm going to tell you that God can heal you in one moment, one memory that is so hurtful. He can do it however he pleases. It could be instantly. It doesn't have to be my story. Your story is your own. Well, maybe I'm the first student to go through this, but I'm going to tell you that God can do it as he pleases. If he do it instantly, it's instantly. But I refuse, and I refuse to lose our youth because we won't face what the world is so afraid, what the church is so afraid to speak about. Okay, so what? I'm going to become unpopular. 
But I'm gonna so guess what? I'm gonna be popular in heaven. How many people when you get to heaven, how many people are gonna be behind you and saying, She's alive, she become to the Lord? Because I share. Let's learn to carry each other's burden. Can you believe how beautiful this house will be if we will start just being divided in theology and opinions and no, let's just be there for the people. Let's not be afraid to talk about mental health illness. Like, no. In any ways, if you have depression and anxiety, that usually is just a sign that there's something that you need to address. Because if we're treating the symptom and we're afraid of the symptom, no, God just wants to go to the root of the problem and he wants to heal you. But because many of us, we don't know what to do. We're afraid. We're afraid. If someone says, like, oh, my God, we're like, send them. Go to that church. <laughs> we don't receive people here that are broken. If you think that, you're so broken and you don't even know it. Amen. So this is a message of hope and a lot of love, okay?